I'd like to welcome you to this uh, third in the uh, fall lecture series, the A. Richard Newton Distinguished Innovator Lecture Series. Uh, I'm very excited to be able to present to you today Dr. Ram Krishnan. Um, he has a, a PhD from Cal um, and uh, two other degrees, one from uh, Duke and one from IIT. Uh, his background includes the following, uh, 25 years of work at Hewlett Packard and additional experience uh, work at Bloom Energy and at Agilent Technologies. And then most recently, uh, he was um, uh, vice president and the head of operations at InventSense, uh, which has since IPO'd, so it's a public company now. And uh, I understand that on the announcement of his retirement, the stock actually dipped. So you can feel the power of, of our speaker here. Um, uh, InventSense is a uh, leading provider of uh, motion sensing MEMS devices used in smartphones, tablets, and other devices, games, TVs, smart TVs, wearables, you know, so forth. Um, uh, you know, quite often uh, we host a lot of software entrepreneurs, and I'm really happy uh, t that Ram is going to be able to introduce to us what's happening in terms of innovation and areas in terms of devices and MEMS, and I think it's very healthy for us to to have enough breadth in, in our innovations um, series. And in addition, Ram's talk is also going to include some operational aspects of innovation. So with that, all of that, I'm very happy that you can be here to present to us. Uh, Ram, come on up. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. I'm really happy to be here. Uh, as, uh, and Eklak, thank you for the introduction. Uh, my name is Ram Krishnan. Um, I was I retired about a year ago from uh, a company called Invincence. Uh, Invincence was a startup. was about 30 people when I joined in 2007. We went IPO in 2011, and then I retired last year in 2012, a uh, couple of quarters after the IPO. So. InventSense was sort of a textbook example of a company that, a startup company that was very successful. Textbook example, because today, I don't know what the stock's doing. By the way, uh, before I forget, disclaimer, please don't run out and buy stock based on my talk and so on. This is, this talk is merely about the period from startup to IPO, okay? I don't know what's going on in the company today, and I'm not going to, uh, I'm not recommending stock one way or the other. So this is, just take it as lessons learned about how to run a company. So having said that, uh, today or yesterday or a couple of days ago, when I looked at it, Inventance uh, market cap, that is the, the value of all the stock outstanding was $1.7 billion, billion with a B. To get there, this company just spent $19 million, $19 million, okay? Which means for a guy who invested his first dollar in the first year of the company, he made roughly 90 bucks for every dollar in, in that period. This uh, was, uh, the, the company was very well run. Now, you need to understand where I came from to, to see why I'm saying that. I worked for HP, as Eklak said, for, for a long time. And <laughs> during the period I was with HP, it went from being one of the greatest companies in the world to being really not that great today, okay? It's uh, somewhat of a sorry mess, and, and, and a lot of reasons why. So I'm putting it in perspective. This is why I think InventSense was so well run. This first, then I went to three different startups. The first startup I went to was a dismal failure. We, we burned through a lot of money, investors' money, and then sold the company for almost nothing. By this time, as you can imagine, I'm thinking, is it me? Every time, every place I go to starts sliding downhill. Then the second startup that I went to uh, is Bloom Energy, as uh, Eklak said. And Bloom is, I would categorize that as a mediocre success. Uh, they're going to return money to the investors, but they have burned through almost a billion dollars, $1 billion, which is a lot of investment money. The third company was InventSense, and as I said, $1.7 billion market cap for a $19 million investment, which is kind of pretty phenomenal, okay? I'm gonna show you some real data that it's not just my gut feel that, uh, that, uh, that, that I'm seeing this from. Okay, 
So today what I'm going to do is tell you how InventSense was able to become such a market leader and, and return that kind of uh, return on money. Um, what I want to, the, and the reason why I'm doing this is, uh, if, you, if you research success rate for startups, it's, depending on who you talk to, it's either one out of 1,000 companies are, have a financial exit that is successful, or it's one out of 10. Either way, it's dismal. So when you find that one company that has done well, you really want to take some lessons from that. This is what this is about. Management is a very inexact science, and it depends on the time, the period during which the, the company is established, as well as a lot of other circumstances. So, and the reason why I'm doing this here is this is an entrepreneurship class, this is an innovation class, and this is Cal, we're in the middle of Silicon Valley, I fully expect from amongst all of you, a few of you will go off, found your own companies, and or some of you will join a startup company and help build it, okay? So I wanted, uh, uh, at the end of my talk, I want you to walk away with one or two lessons of how this team of people built this company to be such a market leader. And hopefully, when you find your own companies, you can apply some of those same lessons. So first tell you what InventSense does, so you have an idea. Uh, InventSense is a MEMS gyroscope and accelerometer producer, okay? And my understanding is not everybody here is an engineer or uh, knows what MEMS is, so I'll, I'll explain that, so bear with me. MEMS stands for microelectromechanical systems. And those of you who have worked in the BSAC uh, lab, you know that this is a bunch of springs and masses that you make within silicon, okay? Uh, this is really intriguing stuff. You, you take a piece of silicon and you can carve out little springs and masses out of it. And then you attach a uh, CMOS processor to it. Now what you have is an intelligent uh, spring mass system that can be used as uh, sensors. These are called inertial sensors. Gyroscopes are angular velocity sensors. And accelerometers, as most of you probably know, are uh, linear acceleration sensors, okay? What are they used for? Uh, you know your smartphone, everybody probably has a smartphone uh, today. If you, if you rotated your smartphone, the, the screen automatically rotates from portrait to landscape. That is, a, that, that is a MEM sensor in there that is detecting that you just rotated the, the phone and turning the screen. But it does more than that. It can do any kind of motion sensing. If you held your phone in your hand, it can actually detect the entire motion. Okay, if you took three axes of gyroscopes and three axes of accelerometer, X, Y, and Z, put them together on a phone, and through the phone, the phone, in theory, could be tracked every minute or every second of the way to wherever it goes and falls. So they use these kinds of things in satellites, they use them in missiles, but here we are only going to talk about consumer electronics and smartphones and gaming. In gaming, uh, InventSense's uh, biggest customer was, is, is still Nintendo. Uh, if any of you have used the Motion Plus, the Wii Motion Plus, that's powered by InventSense. And in the smartphones, uh, Samsung, any of you having a Galaxy uh, phone, that's an InventSense uh, accelerometer and gyroscope in that. Okay, uh, huge market by the way. Uh, we are talking in 2015, we are talking total number of sensors is 1.5 billion units in 2015, which is more than 100 million every month that, that have to be produced. In one sense, was, produced, uh, was founded in 2003, went IPO in 2011. Uh, so eight years to go IPO. And as I mentioned already, uh, today the valuation is pretty high. Very little money was spent to make the company profitable. Uh, the revenue last year, fiscal year, was a little bit over $200, uh, $200 million. Uh, and the operating profit for the last three years has always been over 22%. That, 
By the way, last year uh, that they did it, it was 27% operating profit. And to give you some perspective, because probably no, uh, most of you have not been out in, in the business or you're involved in, uh, in evaluating companies and so on, Apple's uh, operating profit is tw between 27 and 29%. Okay? So this is the same level of profitability th that Apple has. Um, and because of this kind of performance, because the company grew so rapidly, uh, Forbes, the business magazine that you may be familiar with Forbes, named InventSense uh, one of its fastest growing companies. And to give you, again, to give you some perspective, this is uh, 25 companies, I believe, 2013. The top three are LinkedIn, uh, Facebook, and Apple. And InventSense was number, nine, uh, number eight on this list, okay? So uh, I think enough said, it's basically a pretty high-performing company. One more chart I want to show you about uh, InventSense performance. You, the yellow bars are the revenue. That is, this is, the, uh, this is how much product InventSense is shipping every year. Um, and again, I joined here when we started shipping. I left here uh, last year. This year, it is actually 2013. It actually has done 200 million. So this is showing about 154 million, I believe. Phenomenal growth rate. But the more important curve that I want you to look at is that white line out there. And we're going to talk about this later on in the talk. The reason this is important is this is called gross margin. Uh, I'd like a show of hands. How many people know what gross margin is? OK, not bad. Um, but <laughs> most of you don't know it. Gross margin is, is basically uh, also called gross profit. Okay. Gross margin is the profit the company makes before it reinvests in R&D and marketing, and, and some other things, but R&D and marketing. Reason why that's very important, in order for a company to grow, continue growing, they have to invest in R&D. In order to invest in R&D, you have to have a healthy gross margin. You have to have enough gross margin that you can invest in R&D. So in a way, Investors and the stock market looks at that number, that 55%, and says this company has enough money to reinvest in R&D, and therefore it's, it's a good growth stock. Okay? So for anybody out there that wants to found a company, just remember, you cannot go IPO till uh, you actually have 50% plus gross margin. Okay? This is uh, now. Four years. Yeah. What's that? Oh, that, right, right. Uh, so I was going to mention that, uh, except for one disclaimer. If you're in social networking, all bets are off. <laughs> it's, you, could be, you could be losing money like Twitter and still go IPO, but anything to do with hardware or medical or any of the other uh, uh, industries, you have to have a healthy gross margin before you can go IPO. If you go talk to investment bankers, they will not even talk to you unless you have a gross margin of minimum 50%. Because that says that you can reinvest in R&D, okay? And, and uh, just to tell you, finish up, um, uh, we were able to do 55% gross margin. That was our target for the last three years. I think it dipped a little bit this year to 53%, but still very healthy. Okay. So one of the things that I, I told you why I thought InvenSense was a great company and I thought, well, maybe it's just my gut feel and rumor. I'd been with a real dismal flop before that. And I thought it just felt good to be in a company that had gone IPO, and maybe that's why I thought it was great. So I actually wanted to generate some data that said InventSense really was a pretty strong company. What I did was the following. I wanted to measure the return on investment money per year. Okay, The reason why? Let's say you put in a dollar into a, into a company, into a startup company, and it delivers $100. Now, if it delivers it in 100 years, you'll be dead and gone. You don't care by that time. You want it as soon as possible, right? So the metric I came up with was I took market cap soon after the IPO, 
divided by the amount of uh, venture capital funds invested in the company, and then divided by the time from founding of the company to, I, uh, to the time I measured the market cap. And what I did was I took five companies, including InventSense, and these companies are all semiconductor companies. So again, you don't want to compare social networking companies with, with a company like InventSense. It doesn't make sense. If you compare uh, uh, companies uh, in, in the last 20 years that have gone IPO, Cavium was a superstar in the valley. Okay, Cavium is a networking company, was a superstar. They went public in February 07. And what you'll see in this rightmost column is the return factor, is the success factor. So for every $100 invested in InventSense, they return $632 per year. Okay, so in the eight years they went public, if you put in a dollar, you'd have got 50 bucks back. If you waited another two years, meaning this year, you'd have got 90 bucks back, okay? So that's the return rate. Compare that to Cavium, which is uh, down here, about $400 for every $100 invested. So what I'm trying to tell you is, it wasn't just my gut feel, this company really was performing very well. And the stock market, market looks at the performance and then values the company, and that's what the market cap is, is an indicator of. Okay, so it's, it, it is doing very well. Okay, so the important thing is, how did we get there? Okay, and this is, uh, this is the lesson that I would like you to walk away with. How did this company do it? And I'm going to give you my take on it. You know, as I said, management is an inexact science. Um, a lot of things went into making the company successful, but I'm going to present only one or two of the things that I thought were the most important, okay? Now, if you, let's say tomorrow you get this great idea and you want to found a company. You go out, uh, you want to build a product, and you go Google it to say, if I built a company, how can I be sure that I can go IPO in, let's say, five years and make a ton of money? Okay, maybe, maybe that's, you have a very narrow goal there, which is okay. What you'll find on, on uh, different websites is three or four things that are very commonly uh, given as advice. The first one is find a big market, okay? Uh, second one is raise enough money to last you the five years before you go IPO and spend it very, very frugally. Spend it, you know, be really a penny pincher. Third one is develop IP because remember the first day you announce your product, you put it out there in the world, if it's a big enough market, the competition will take it and they will take it apart, they'll build it cheaper in China and pretty soon you're out of business. So make sure that you patent everything that you do. Be very paranoid, okay? This, Andy Grove said this, only the paranoid survive. If you go out and found a company, you go work for a company, everything you do is your secret. Uh, I mean, within the company, that is. I don't, I don't mean keep secrets from, from other people in the company. So be paranoid about your intellectual property. Okay, that's, that's number three. And then the last one is once you have come up with this plan and you've done all of these other things, make sure that you have a plan and you execute to the plan. Okay, now InventSense did all of those things because remember the smartphone market is a two or three billion dollar market for sensors is two or three billion dollar market. Okay, we raised 38 million dollars and spent 19 million out of that. So. You know, we raised sufficient amount of money and we spent it very frugally, we, we did all of those things. But we did something additional and that's the lesson I want you to walk away with, okay? This is what, if you take uh, 10 successful companies or, or the five successful companies that I showed you and you pick the leader amongst those, there is something different that company did, especially when that leader is uh, returning twice what the other guys are returning, okay? There's something different. And this is what I believe InventSense did, made it stand apart. The first thing is, think about it. You guys are mostly engineers. 
when you found a company, you're going to come up with a product idea which says, I can build a widget, I can build a gyroscope, and I can, it'll perform better than the next guy's gyroscope. Okay, great. Uh, you, you, you guys all remember that you build a better mousetrap and the world will beat a path to your door, right? If you think about it, let's say you can build a better mousetrap and the world does beat a path to your door, you just presented yourself with two big problems. The first big problem is if you, if you can sell that mousetrap for, if you can only sell that mousetrap for a dollar, you better have built it for 50 cents. Otherwise, you're going to lose money. That's number one. Number two, if the world really does come to your door, that's, a billion, that's billions of people. Do you have the capacity to supply that? Because if you don't, they're going to go buy the other mousetrap. Okay? So it is very important if you go out and found companies, you go join a startup, have a plan for profitability. Okay? A sustained profitability is very critical. Remember what I told you, the companies that become great and do very well, become market leaders, are the ones who have sustained profit profitability because not only does the stock market value them highly, but they have the money to put back into R&D. Even if you do social entrepreneurship, if you don't want to be a one-trick pony, if you want to survive for, for a long time, if you want to build a company to last, you have to have sustained profitability. Okay, so that's number one. And this is what Invincents did. They had a strategy for sustained profit profitability, and I'm going to show you how. Okay, this is pretty interesting stuff for engineers anyway. Uh, the second one is, Having a plan and a strategy is great, okay? But if only the CEO and a handful of vice presidents are the ones executing to the plan, then you really won't go very far because eventually with the IPO, the CEO leaves, the VPs leave, and now what do you have? You have a company that basically will fall down, okay? Uh, you remember how uh, in the old days, the Roman galleons, the, the ships, used to be uh, real uh, powerhouses. The way they did that was get everybody to row in the same direction, okay? So, same lesson here is if you can get the entire company, all the engineers, all the technicians, everybody, all the managers, to row, to work to the same plan, then you've got something major, okay? Then it doesn't matter if one or two people move away or fall down on the job. The company is continuing to move along the same direction. So, second... Um, a second uh, big thing that Invincents did was teaching the entire team to execute to plan. We, we made it a culture, and I'm going to show you again how we did that. The last one is improve continuously. Okay? Again, if you are profitable one year, the next year it takes a lot of energy to, for the management to go make sure that all, we're hitting all the metrics and uh, hitting on all cylinders. You're much better off, and, and, and this is especially a problem, big problem, by the way. When I joined Invincents, it was 30 people. By the time I left, it was 250 people. There is no way. I had uh, a staff of about 100 people. Okay? There was no way that I could take, uh, figure out what every one of those 100 people was doing. You want to put in place a, a, a process that goes on autopilot for at least some of the stuff and then sample what is going wrong in, in each of those processes, okay? So you need a continuous improvement process. Okay, so these are the three big things that Inventions did, in my opinion, that made it a standout. Okay, so how did they do that? Uh, I've just pretty much finished telling you. First thing is we developed IP for financial performance, so for profitability and sustained profitability, and I'm going to show you how. Second, we executed as part of the culture. So it was a culture in Invincents to decide fast and to act fast. Okay, this is what execution is about. The plan was very critical. Nobody could say, I'm sorry, I'm late by a week. Didn't, didn't work. And the last one was we put in a continuous in, uh, improvement in infrastructure. I may not have time to show that one, but, but we'll, we'll uh, look at it in a minute. Okay, so now, Let's take the first problem, profitability, okay? 
So now I'm going to roll you back to 2003. This is the year InventSense was founded. And the problem was this, OK? First, there were some very large entrenched companies in, in uh, selling gyroscopes and accelerometers uh, that year. And these were companies like Bosch, uh, ST Microsystems, Analog Devices, and so on. And they were selling gyroscopes to automotive and other industries, but not to consumer electronics. They were pricing the gyros at $3, more than $3, $3 to $10 each. But the consumer electronics market, the smartphone market, and the, and the gaming market, and the, and the camera market, the digital still cameras, all wanted a $1 gyro, OK? So how do you, if, if you're selling it for 3 bucks, you can't sell it for less than 3 bucks. It's probably costing you at least $1.50 to build it. How do you sell it for a dollar, right? You lose money on it. So that was the very first problem InventSense faced. Second challenge was, as I mentioned, startup companies need to have a gross margin of greater than 50%. If you don't have a 50% at least, you can't go IPO. If you can't go IPO, you probably are going to, at some point, become a one-trick pony. Okay, so. Which means I have to now sell a gyroscope for one third of the market price, one third, one dollar versus three. But now I have to build it to make 50% gross margin. I have to build it for 50 cents. Okay? So this was a challenge. The, an additional challenge automotive market is different, uh, other markets are different, but the consumer electronics market, now you all own smartphones. You know how your smartphone cost goes down every year, year after year? Guess what? It's those poor slobs that are supplying into the smartphone that are getting beaten up for those kind of prices, OK? Which means if you're supplying to a Samsung today for a dollar, next year they will only pay you 75 cents, or they'll take their business elsewhere, OK? So here's the problem. If this year I can sell for a dollar, I, to make my 50% gross margin, I, got, I have to make it for 50 cents. But I have a big challenge coming up next year. At 75 cents, now I've got to build it for 37 cents. So part of my strategy, part of my plan, part of my intellectual, uh, patentable intellectual prop property better be how to build it this year for a dollar or for 50 cents, next year for 37 or less. Okay? I have to have a plan. And then here's the next problem. Remember the mousetrap uh, uh, analogy I gave you? If you do sell to smartphones, the smartphones are practically everybody in the world. Okay? You have, as I said, 1.5 billion of these. That's 100 million a month that you're going to do. The problem was in 2003, MEMS was a very, very boutique kind of a business. Everything was hand-built. This is why it was so expensive. Everything was hand-built and hand-tested, people were building tens of thousands of units, maybe a million units uh, per month. If you sold to the smartphone business, you had to have minimum 10 million unit capacity per month. Okay, So this was another major problem. So given those challenges, pretty daunting stuff, there's an additional one that I, I want to tell you about. Let's say you came up with solutions for all of those. Okay. The day you came out with your cheaper gyro that you had 10 million capacity for, guess what? Bosch, ST, uh, micro analog devices, all were just waiting for that kind of an opportunity. They take your product apart, they figure out how you did it, and they go build it in China, or build it, figure out how to do it. These guys have deep pockets, okay? They have billions of dollars. They can go figure out how to build it faster, cheaper, and they'll kick your butt. You'll be, you'll be closed down in no time. Okay, so whatever you do, patent it. Okay, whatever you figure out, make it a patentable solution. Keep them out because this is your defensive barrier. Okay, so before I show you how Invention solved the problem, I need to explain to you how a gyroscope works. Why why this was so hard to do? Okay, so this uh, uh, first of all, as I said, a gyroscope is an angular velocity sensor. Okay. Now, what you're looking at out there, these two red things are masses. Okay? They're, they're ma Think about a tuning fork. 
the tuning fork, the two sides of the tuning fork vibrate, right? So this, this is similar to that. Think about it the same way. These are two masses that are carved out of silicon. You take a hunk of silicon and you etch it so that you get two masses like this. The blue or purple things here are, are also pieces of silicon, but they behave like springs. And they attach these red masses to this green frame outside. And the green frame is your integrated circuit, your IC. OK. So the way gyroscopes work is that you have these two masses operating at a fixed frequency, very, very fixed frequency. And that's this uh, Greek letter nu. And let's say I take that entire green frame and I rotate it like this. Okay, let's say it's attached to your smartphone and you take your smartphone and you rotate the smartphone like this. And you rotate it with some unknown velocity omega. Okay, it turns out uh, from your high school physics you might remember uh, the, the term Coriolis, Coriolis force, Coriolis acceleration. Okay. So it turns out that if, if these things are vibrating with a very fixed frequency up and down like this, and you rotate that entire uh, frame with this omega, the whole frame develops this acceleration or force, Coriolis force, which is equivalent to this kind of an equation. Okay, two nu, uh, this is uh, the vector mu uh, multiplier of, of uh, product of omega, uh, multiplied uh, with omega, okay? Uh, so it develops this, but it's in, it's what it called, uh, in what is called the right-hand rule. So, uh, and, and without going to the details of that, basically what will happen is that this whole frame, this circular frame will rotate like this. So it'll, it'll basically rotate, okay, back and forth like that, okay? That's the force. That's the Coriolis force. So, if you can detect that Coriolis force, if you can detect that acceleration, then I can use this equation and calculate my unknown omega. Remember, this is what I want to calculate. I want to know if I shake my phone like this, or my Nintendo Wii, I, I move it, the Wii uh, motion, uh, the wand, detects it and transmits it to the screen, which is why you see your cursor moving around. Okay, that's the idea. So you want to calculate this omega from because you can measure this. How do you measure the uh, Coriolis acceleration? What you're measuring is you have two fixed uh, fingers like this, and you have a third finger which is attached to this yellow ring here. See this? This is attached to those masses. So your, your uh, yellow ring is actually moving the, 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 the moving fingers against the two fixed fingers, and what you can measure is the relative capacitance, the change in capacitance, okay? So by measuring change in capacitance, you can actually, uh, that is proportional to this. So using that, you can calculate the omega, and that's how gyroscopes work. This is how a MEMS gyroscope works. You can calculate omega at any given instant, okay? So, what is so hard about this? Why does it take a uh, dollar fifty or three dollars to build these things? And why can't you build them uh, en mass? Why can't you build ten million of them? Okay, the problem is the following: this new has to be very, very fixed. If there is air friction around these moving masses they move at different frequencies, and that's a problem because now your gyroscope is going to put out different outputs, okay? That's the first problem. Second problem is, you know how your smartphone keeps running out of power? That power is, is the power, that partly the power required to run this gyroscope up and down. There is a certain amount of current required to run it, and if it requires a lot of current, it's going to drain your battery, okay? So another big requirement is, you cannot pull a lot of current out of the out of the out of the gyroscope uh, with the gyroscope. So these are the two big problems, and so the whole thing has to be in vacuum. Okay, so that's the first problem. The second big problem is, you know, this uh, big motion that you're seeing here. 
It's in attofarads. Um, I don't know if you guys know what attofarads are, but we are running out of time, so I'm going to tell you what it is. An attofarad is 10 to the power of minus 18 farads. This is a really, really small number, okay? So you have two problems here to solve. One is you need a vacuum around the gyroscope, and second is you've got to measure really small signals. This is why people couldn't do it very cheaply. Now, in 2003, this is how people built a MEMS device. They did a CMOS in one fab, a MEMS wafer in another fab. They got a ceramic substrate from somewhere, and they assembled each uh, those three things together in a, in a fourth facility. They wire bonded them together. You can see MEMS, CMOS, wire bonding to the ceramic substrate. Once they uh, did this whole assembly, was the first time, first time they could get to test this thing. Because remember, a MEMS is just springs and masses. It, it's not an entire, it's a pretty dumb device. You really have to attach a CMOS to it to be able to test it. But the problem with that is, here you test it, and let's say this thing fails, this assembly fails. You have no choice but to throw it away. What you've done is you've spent a lot of money on two ICs, an expensive substrate, assembly process, and the whole thing, and now you're throwing it away. This was one of the big reasons why MEMS cost so much in those days. And this is one of the, all this assembly, this complicated assembly process, was why they couldn't build more than a million a month, at the most. Okay? It required a lot of labor, and it required a lot of automation. So here's how we solved it. Our, our founder, CEO, solved it. Uh, what he did was uh, he came up with a way to combine these two wafers together. Okay? And he called it CMOS MEMS. And I'm going to show you how he did it. He combined it together, and all of a sudden now, guess what happens? You have not only one wafer that comes out instead of going to two different foundries, you not only have one wafer, but it's intelligent. You can actually test it immediately, okay? Not only can you test it, but guess what? Foundries have, a typical foundry has capacity of about 30,000 wafers a month. One wafer, you can put in four or 5,000 gyros, okay? So instantly you have from just one foundry in the world, and there are thousands of foundries in the world, one foundry alone, you can produce 120 million units per month. So what you've done is you've taken all of this manual labor of assembly and you put it in an assembly line that already exists, the foundry. Okay? So you've solved two major problems. The first one is cost, because you can test right away and tell which are bad dye. Don't assemble them. Assemble only the good dye. Okay? Second, you have instantly produced that volume that we were talking about, all right? So we do the wafer test, then we package it in a very cheap package, and we do a final test and ship it to the customer. And this is what the InvenSense dye looks like. So this is the MEMS up on top, this is the CMOS, and what you can't see here are the connections that this you use for the CMOS to connect to the outside world. Okay. So how is it done? Here's how uh, this is done. And, and by the way, uh, Steve Nasiri was the founder of the company. He invented this process. Uh, Steve's a Berkeley grad. So uh, in fact, all three founders uh, for, of InventSense were Berkeley grads. So you should feel, you should feel proud. Um, so uh, again, this is, how, this is a traditional MEMS at that time. Um, you take a silicon wafer, simple silicon wafer, then you do a bunch of stuff to it, which I'll, I won't explain right now, I'll tell you later. You take a second wafer, the brown one is a second silicon wafer, simple wafer, and then what you do is you put uh, two sets of bumps. You see this wide bump out here? This bump is not just a bump, it's actually a ring. It's an entire ring, and guess you, some of you can probably guess why we are putting that ring down. That is the ring that is going to seal this vacuum around the gyroscope, okay? And you'll see how. Okay, 
uh, and, and this inside bump, by the way, these are electrical contacts. So this is the MEM side, and here comes the, okay. For, first thing we do is we make the MEMS out of it. So that, that brown uh, wafer that we had, it's called the device layer. We etch masses, these are the masses in the springs, okay, into it. So you've just created your MEMS uh, gyroscope mechanism. Now what you do is you take the CMOS wafer, which you have fabbed in the same fab, and this is your CMOS, which has the intelligent processing capability. And this CMOS has aluminum pads on it, which match these pads, these bumps, okay? Aluminum on CMOS is a very standard process. You etch some cavities in this CMOS. Now, if you look at it, these are the gyroscope masses and springs. They work within this cavity. That's why you're creating the cavities. It needs room to bounce up and down. Okay, and then you take the CMOS and you press it into the MEMS wafer at high temperature and under pressure. But at the same time you're doing something else, you're pulling air out of this cavity. Okay, so what happens is that the germanium here, uh, the red, red uh, things I think I mentioned, uh, this is germanium that you deposit on those bumps, melts into the aluminum and forms a very strong alloy. Okay, this is called a eutectic alloy. And what happens is this outside, these outside bumps, this ring that I was telling you, that basically becomes a seal. So what you've done is you've created this nice vacuum chamber for the gyroscope to work in. But you've done something else which is also very good, which is you've connected, electrically connected the MEM side to the CMOS side through these bumps here, okay? So now you can test it immediately, okay? I'm going to hit one more thing and then I'm going to open it up to questions. Why a startup must, must execute? And I'm, I'll keep it short. Basically, a startup is a very fast company. You have to decide fast and act fast. Because if you acted just like the big guys, they'll, uh, you know, they'll uh, trounce you. They'll walk all over you and you'll be gone in no time. So the, uh, the hallmark of a startup is that it, they are very agile. Okay? The approach that Invincents took was that we had to become, we had to make agility a part of the culture, execution a part of the culture. And this is how we did it. This is how we did it. And I'm going to cover this very rapidly. Basically, the way we did it was we tied part of every engineer, every executive's compensation to execution, okay? We had a grant plan that said, you gotta have 10 million units capacity, you gotta have so much yield, you gotta have all of this stuff to be profitable. But then we took that and we broke it up into everybody's goals. And we, to each person, we handed them a goal every quarter. And about 15%, and, and for executives like me, up to 30% of my salary was connected to these goals. So, and, and by the way, a lot of companies do this, but here's where Invincents did it differently. There was very strict scoring, okay? What that means is, let's say I had to deliver 80% yield on, uh, for one particular quarter, and I delivered 79. I didn't get 90% of the marks. I got 50% of the marks, okay? And, this was a slap on the wrist to say, target 85% dummy. Next time you'll hit maybe 82% and you'll get your entire marks. That could dock, uh, you know, if 30% of my salary was tied to this, I could easily lose in a year 15%. Now, it wasn't quite that punitive. People didn't lose that much money, but it was enough that people learned over time that they had to decide very quickly and act very fast, okay? And we don't have enough time to get into the details of what I mean by that, but uh, if you know what design of experiments is, for example, engineers love design of experiments. We basically allowed people to do one design of experiments and then they had to make a decision, okay? There was no second design of experiments. That's what I mean, you have to use engineering judgment very often to, to make very fast decisions that's what we were forcing. 
It worked great because by the time we went IPO, we had 90 patents. We were extremely profitable. And year after year, we came out with a breakthrough product. Every year, we came out with a breakthrough product. To date, InventSense's chips are still the best performing out there. They're considered the technology leader. And this was how culture made a big difference. Okay? I'm not going to cover this uh, too much because we've run out of time and I know some of you will leave. Uh, but essentially, we put in place what's called a continuous improvement process. Again, you want some of the company to be on autopilot because if you had to manually go do everything, by the time the company was 200 people, there was no way for the executives to pay attention to everything. So this is a continuous improvement process for yield and quality. And we built this Taiwan factory which, uh, where we put this continuous improvement process. These are our automated testers, by the way, final testers. We were producing 10 million units out of this every month. Uh, it's probably a lot more now than it was then. OK, so in summary, the way InventSense became a market leader was by having a plan to be profitable on a sustained basis. They made execution to the plan part of the culture. And last of all, they put in a continuous improvement infrastructure that allowed us to basically go on autopilot for at least some of those very key metrics like yield and quality and so on, OK? I'm done. Um, so I know some of you have to leave, but uh, if you have any quick questions, I'll take them now. Uh, and I'll be glad to hang around after that for, for you to ask questions. Yeah. So. So um, let me, so perfectly, I think you've sealed it quite well here. So uh, I just want to kind of help the wrap up, which is uh, to thank you for basically uh, helping, you know, seal together or, or mix the ideas of the depth of the technology, the financial metrics of the firm, and the culture and how all these things fit together. Very much appreciate it. As uh, he just said, uh, if you've got questions, come on down. And I know we're at 6 o'clock, so if you have to go, uh, please go ahead. Thanks.